Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome from my side to the presentation of my doctoral dissertation, in which I've been trying to use a communication technique called synchronous transmission for the design of a new class of cyber-physical systems. Nowadays, the type of application we are envisioning for CPS are, have even more uh, challenging requirements. However, in order to be able to get there, we need to use simpler system to understand, to understand the dynamics of what's happening. One such representative system that we often use in academic research is a so-called inverted pendulum. It is a rather simple mechanical system in which we have a cart here that can move left and right uh, along the rail, on top of which is mounted a pole, which oscillates also left and right, and the goal of the game is to move the cart left and right in order to keep the, the pendulum stabilized upright. This is a rather well understood uh, problem and systems. However, things do get a bit more tricky when we start separating the system we are trying to control from the place where we actually perform the computations. In the context of my thesis, I've been looking in how we can do this by, by having the communication in between uh, over a multi-hop wireless network. Now, um, the, the objectives for the communication system in such an application are uh, predictability, adaptability, and efficiency. And one thing that I would like to stress here at this point is that in this project, we have been looking at predictability from an end-to-end -end perspective. What it means is that we are not only interested in meeting deadlines across the network just for the communication, but what really matters is that we can guarantee end-to-end -end deadline, which means that we need to be able to specify how long it will take for the application tasks to communicate with one another. So we need, we need to go all the way. Obviously, there has been work that I've been trying to address, adaptability and predictability on the communication side. However, so far, it has been mostly either or. Furthermore, there has been, at least before my thesis, no work proposed that we try to capture this end-to-end -end, uh, di dimension that I mentioned. So the overall objective of my dissertation was to try to see if we could combine this end-to-end -end predictability, adaptability, and efficiency altogether. So we have been trying out this, this, uh, this story example of trying to control inverted pendulums. And what you can see here is a network, a multi-hop network, uh, with one such pendulum on one side and a controller on the other side. And the first thing you can show is that indeed we have been able to uh, prove that we are able to s safely stabilize one of the such pendulums, even though the controller is on the other side of the network. And it doesn't stop there. If we take this controller, and then we start working around in the network. If you look carefully here, you'll see nothing at all. No difference whatsoever. What does that mean? It means that actually the performance of the system is completely independent on the mobility of the nodes. In this case, the mobility of the controller, but that will work for any other node in the network. From a communication side, this feat has been enabled by the use of this technique that we call synchronous transmission. And the overall claim of my thesis has been to prove, to show that indeed this technique is well suited for the design of real-time wireless cyber-physical systems. To be slightly more concrete, here are the things that I, I've, I've been working on. Uh, I've used this technique to implement two different real-time system designs, but I've also worked on more tools and method aspects to facilitate the, the use of this technique and also to uh, try to improve a bit on the reproducibility of the type of experiments we do in networking research. In the rest of this talk, I will try to sketch uh, some overview of, uh, of this contribution. Um, the first work uh, I, I, I worked on was this protocol called DRP, which I don't have time to get into details. Instead, I will spend a bit more time talking about TTW, that stands for Time Triggered Wireless. Uh, that, as I mentioned, use this technique of synchronous transmission, which is what? Right. I've been talking about that a bit, a lot. It's essentially a way of implementing a multi-hop broadcast in a, uh, based on a flooding strategy. So roughly, the idea is that if one node sends a message, the message will propagate through the network in waves, looking a bit like that. There are quite a few tricks involved into getting this to work, uh, but believe me, it does, and when it does work, uh, what it enables us to do is to uh, abstract away the complexity of the multi-hop network and realize a one-to-hole communication or broadcast with very predictable timing. 
And when we do so, because the timing is so predictable, we can essentially encapsulate this entire floating process into just a small time slot. And then we could do this over and over and realize communication in just independent time slots. And we know we can just consider that in which time slot one node is able to communicate through the entire network. So we can encapsulate those time slots in rounds. And in between rounds, we're going to turn off all the radios in order to save energy. And this is going to be the typical way we're going to organize communication based on synchronous transmissions. So that's about the structure. Now, on top of the structure, how do you get predictability? Well, if you want to meet deadlines, you need to use real-time scheduling. What does real-time scheduling for communication looks like? You're going to have some messages with release times and deadlines. You can analyze your system and then schedule all your rounds and then assign the messages to the round. Fair enough. But how do you get the message deadlines? Or the release times? You get them once you know when your tasks are being executed. Because those are the tasks that are generating the messages and consuming the information that is in there. So if we go back to our pendulum example, it is only once we know when the task is going to be executed that we're going to be able to obtain our uh, message deadlines and then schedule our network. The bottom line being that we need to have some sort of coupling between the scheduling of the task and the scheduling of the messages. This can be done in various ways, and in TTW, we do this by statically co-scheduling all tasks and messages. Uh, essentially, the idea is that we're going to synthesize all the schedules offline uh, using a linear, by solving a linear program, and then we're going to execute those tables, those schedules at runtime, over and over again the same ones. However, even though this is a classical and well-known technique, there are a few tricks involved into getting it right for our settings because we're using rounds, which implies that we have some constraints like this that needs to be uh, verified. To think like a message needs to be served in a round that finishes before the message deadline. Now, how would you formulate something like that? How would you formalize that? You could say something like the message deadline needs to be larger than the round J starting time plus the length of the round. But this should be true only if and when the, mode, the message i is assigned to the round j. Right? However, here we have a slight issue is that both those things here are variables of our problem. So this constraint is nonlinear and is not something we can use directly in a linear program. So we found a trick to work around this issue and combine the rounds with a, a classical linear program, which is somehow inspired from network calculus where the idea is to define functions that count for each message, the number of instances that have been released, uh, have been served, and have passed their deadline. And the trick is that we can, using those functions, we can reformulate this nonlinear constraint into something that looks like this. And then if we look at how those functions are being defined, these are actually either a linear term or piecewise constant, and both those things are things that we know how to implement within a milk with, again, some tricks, but that's kind of commonly known. Good. So that gives us the predictability. However, the downside of a static schedule is that everything is static, right? Um, however, in the literature, there have been solutions proposed to deal and mitigate this, this limitation, which typically is to use multiple operation rounds. So the idea is that the same system will have different tables, and they'll switch between the different tables at runtime. Uh, in our case, what we were interested in is to try to uh, do this multi-mode case while being able to still meet deadlines across the mode changes. This again can be done in slightly different ways. And in TDW, we have tried to make this in order to limit the impact of the mode changes on the energy consumption for communication. Good. So in summary, this is a very fast view of how TTW is designed. But this is just a design. If we really want to solve our problem, we need to implement this design and to actually verify that it works. And it's precisely to facilitate this implementation task that we have worked on this uh, framework called Baloo. So the general idea about Baloo has been to try to, uh, trans to, to uh, transfer from a traditional approach we would have to implement such communication protocol based on synchronous transmission something slightly more flexible. 
And the key idea uh, was to try to uh, decouple as much as possible the implementation of the protocol from the interaction with the radio. So we've, we've uh, made some design choices, we did that, and we've used this uh, framework to implement, for example, TTW. Then, once we have the framework implemented, what do we do? We go to the state of the performance evaluation. Now comes the tricky part. How would you evaluate the performance of your protocol? You run it once, you measure, you see how it works. Good. But is it really good? Like how many times would you actually need to measure in order to really be confident in your results? 10 times, 100 times, a million times? You don't really know. And it doesn't really tell you how, much co how confident you would be. And if you look in the general uh, literature, you would see that, oh, research is trustworthy when the results are reproducible. But what does that mean for us? What does that mean reproducible for networking experiments? And it's precisely trying to answer those questions that we started to work on this uh, framework that we ended up calling TriScale. So, what is reproducibility? But formally, we could say that an experiment is reproducible if we can obtain the same results when we rerun the experiment under the same conditions. Now, the first issue we have is with the same conditions. Because we are doing radio frequency network, um, uh, we have a radio frequency environment that we cannot really control, and we know that it will impact the performance of our of system very strongly. So we cannot really obtain this. Therefore, how would you qualify or quantify what same results actually mean? Right? We know we expect performance variation, so how much is expected and how much is tolerable to consider being reproducible? So we, we started thinking about this performance variability, and I argue that you can see performance variability along at least three different time scales. First is the time scale of a run. You run your protocol once, you measure some quantity x that will vary over time, and then at the end of this uh, run, you will somehow aggregate your result with using a metric, for example, the mean of your measurements. Good. Then you will repeat this experiment in what I, in what I call a series of runs, and your metric value is, will most probably vary over time. Right, so you need, again, to, to uh, account for this variability. And this is often done using what is called a key performance indicator, or a KPI. That could be, for example, the median of the metric value you've obtained. Now, this is fine. But if you do this a month later, or even a year later, you rerun the same series of runs, likely you will, again, ob obtain different KPIs. And if we think back of reproducibility, what we want is to be able to say we have obtained the same thing under the same conditions. But is this the same thing, or is it not? This is, again, a third scale of performance variability. And we need to be able to quantify and rationalize about all those different time scales of variability in order to be able to say, yes or no, this is reproducible. So the goal of TriScale has been to try to answer those questions of how we should size our experiments in order to uh, answer this question. And the goal is really, really to try to find rational answers. That means that we want to be able to quantify the trade-off between how much effort I put in into my experiments and how much, how much confidence I get in the results. I'll give you an example on one of those questions, uh, how we answer uh, how many runs do we have in a series. Why do we run many runs? We do many runs because essentially based on a sample of metric values, we are trying to estimate the underlying distribution on which we want to compute some KPI. If we want to do this, because we, we will never know the complete distribution, we will never be 100% sure where the median actually is. We only have the samples. To do, to do this estimation, we need to use something called confidence intervals. Uh, to give you an example, if I say that A, B is a 95% confidence interval for the median and some quantity X, it means that the true value of the median of the distribution of x, which I don't know, is between a and b with a probability which is at least as large as 95%. Uh, this probability here is what is called the confidence level. Now, what KPIs should we use? Uh, two KPIs that are often used in, in, in literature are the mean and the standard deviation. And the reason we use them is because they are very convenient to estimate the underlying distribution of the data we're studying. But do they really? Well, they would only if 
we knew for sure that the underlying distribution of the data is normal. And the sad thing is, we never know whether the data is normal or not, and actually there are a lot of evidence that show that the networking experiment data is not normally distributed. And we anyway don't know, and have no way of knowing. So we should not use that, because this, this gives us no information about the shape of the distribution. So instead, what Triscale recommends is to use uh, percentiles as KPI. And the reason we propose to use the percentiles is that because there exist non-parametric methods that allow to compute those confidence intervals we are aiming for to, uh, to do our estimation. I don't really have time to go in the detail of how the, the method works, but the most important thing is that this method gives us a relation between the minimal number of samples we need and the estimation of any uh, percentile at any confidence level. Which means that I can say, for example, I want to estimate the first percentile of my distribution with this level of probability, and that gives me a minimal number of runs of at least about 300. So that's the direct, this is how we, we build um, a rational answer, or provide a rational answer to the question. Now, concretely, how would we apply this methodology in practice? If we look again at our TTW example, we have a model of the round, how long the round takes. And we, this model should be both safe, so that the rounds do not overrun, and it should be tight so that we don't waste too much uh, bandwidth, we don't waste too much time in our schedule. So as metric, we could use, for example, the maximum measure time for the round across all the nodes in the network during a run. And then as KPI, you take a high percentile and a high confidence level, and then you do, you run the math, you say, okay, I need a minimal of 60 runs in order to obtain this confidence level for that percentile, and you run the experiments. So we've done this for uh, some parameters of the model. You obtain the distribution of the matrix values. Here is the KPI and here is the model value. And you see that indeed the KPI is smaller than the model, so the bound is safe. And if you look at the numerical values, they are actually very close to one another. So we're also quite tight. And obviously we've tried this for a larger range of parameters and we observe similar um, uh, results in, in all the cases. So the bottom line is that by following this methodology, here is the exact claim we can make. We can say that with 95% confidence, the maximum runtime will be smaller than the model value in at least 95% of the cases. What about the 5% that are left? We don't really know. We can have ideas and hypotheses, but we cannot claim anything about them. But we can claim something about the other 95%. Good. Uh, to conclude on Triscale, uh, we have implemented this methodology into a framework that provides all the tools, uh, statistical method, and, and support to, to be practical, as practical as possible uh, to use for the experimenters. And with that, um, I would like, this concludes already the very short overview of the different contribution that I've made in my thesis. At this point, I would like to mention that uh, all the work that has been done uh, the code produced and the data collected is openly available, and you can find uh, all the links in the dissertation. And I'm left with a uh, big thanks to uh, all the people that I've been working with during all this time. Uh, I'm happy to see quite a few of them in the room today. I also would like to thank my wife, my friends, and my parents that also remind me that life is not just work. And there are also a few fun things to do beside that. So thank you very, very much uh, to all of you. Uh, that concludes my presentation.